Hello and welcome to the Hustle and Know Entrepreneurial Experience. We are an entrepreneurship book club moving into the podcast world. My name is Julie, I'm your host, and I have a passion for knowledge and love education. And joining us today, we have Joseph Warren, co-owner of Financial Planning HQ. And then we also got Sean Townley, who's an entrepreneur, consultant, speaker, and geek. So... Today, we're going to discuss the book, The Happiness Advantage, The Seven Principles of Positive Psychology That Fuel Success and Performance at Work, by Sean Acker? Acker. Okay. Sorry, Sean. Sean Acker. Acker. Okay. <laughs> A-C-H-O-R. Okay. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, first question, team. In one word or sentence, give me your synopsis of the book. If you were the author, what main point do you want the reader to take away from this book? Who's going first today? Joseph? Okay. <laughs> go I'm happy to go first. And I think the main premise of this book that Sean, I'll say Acre, Acre is saying, is that we've been putting the cart before the horse when it comes to happiness and success. So like we're taught all our lives that once you become successful, once you do this thing, once you get married, or once you buy that dream car, then you'll be happy. But really it's the opposite. Like once you're happy, then you, things start happening in your favor. You're more aware of the options that you have for success and that lines you up so that you're more likely to become successful. So happiness first and then success, not success and then happiness. Love it, short and sweet, love it, very true. Yeah. Okay, Sean? Yeah, I'll piggyback off that. Be happy to be happy. Sounds a little bit like a, an oxymoron, but you're right. I mean, you know, if you want to be happy, you can't go out there and succeed to be happy. You have to be happy in order to succeed, which is kind of cool when you think about it because happiness doesn't cost anything. It's just state of mind. It gives you an opportunity to have nothing and be able to, to conquer the world because if you get into the right mindset, if you get your mind in the right place, then the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Very true. Um, okay, my turn. I absolutely love this book. If Just like not reading my notes or anything. I just feel like this is just a, the happiness advantage book is about a different way to perceive life, like through happiness, you know, and a lot of it, it it's done like cause and effect. So be ha like Joseph was saying, like you happy first, then the success will come. It's not the reverse. So, um, and I think also the goal of this book he mentioned is there's a lot of inspirational books out there, you know, um, but, you know, it could just be mumbo jumbo, you know, this book is based off of scientific study and research and proven principles and concepts. So it's literally saying like, this book is proven, like happiness works. <laughs> like <laughs> It's not mumbo jumbo. So, and that way is described in seven different principles, which is... Take my handy dandy notes out. It's principle one, happiness advantage. Principle two, the fulcrum and the lever. Principle three, the Tetris effect. And we'll go into a few of these that are good as the discussion happens. <laughs> um, principle four, falling up, not down. Principle five, the Zoro, Zoro circle. Um, principle six, the 20 second rule, as in seconds, not as in the 22nd number because I got confused that's why I had to say that <laughs> and social <laughs> and social investment is principle seven so all of that you can use to make yourself happy so and we will discuss a few of these very soon so moving on then um question number two tell us what you liked best about the book and what you disliked about the book Okay, Sean, I'm put you on the hot seat. All right, well, thank you. I, I think the thing that I was challenged with the book is he spent a fair bit of time talking about how it wasn't mumbo-jumbo, so he, 
you know, kind of he kind of got defensive with this whole deal about the happiness thing. He even had people in example saying, "Okay, Sean, what is this BS? We all know this is BS. Why, why are we even doing this?" And so I, he felt a little defensive. So I was I was a little surprised about that. But my favorite part of the book was the twenty second rule. I think this is one that we've heard in different flavors over the time where if you're going to do something, do it for 20 seconds or make it 20 seconds easier, like playing guitar, mm -hmm. which is the example he was using. And so I need to start playing guitar more. So maybe that hit home. And the other cool thing is he spells his name the right way. <laughs> S-H-A-W-N. <laughs> okay. Anything that you disliked or just the fact that he was defensive? He was kind of whiny sometimes, yes, defending his book. So it, was, just, it was not, it was it, scientific, scientific mumbo jumbo. I disagree with that. I think he was just stating a fact because that's what most people are going to say. As he gave examples, he did all these different seminars on the happiness advantage. And almost every single time people were like, ah, this is crap. So I think he was just laying that out because he's like, I know what you're thinking. You think this is crap, but it's not. So he's a Texan from Waco, and he spent way too much time at Harvard, and then that's what made him feel defensive. <laughs> I don't know about that, but okay. To each to own. <laughs> okay, Joseph, what about you? What did you like and dislike? I agree 100% with the premise of the book. I think it can be a life-changing book if you really follow it. That's... But what I really like, what really drew me in was the humor. It was really good use of humor. And that kept me engaged the whole time. And I especially was like cracking up when he would talk trash about Yale. I don't know why that, I just found that so funny. When he just kept talking trash about Yale. Um, but it's real good practical advice. And I, if I had to say one thing to improve in this book or one thing that I didn't like was that he named things in a way that isn't memorable. Like the Tetris effect, in my opinion, you can't just see that and be like, oh yeah, I got to do this. Like, you have to kind of look up, like, what is a Tetris effect? Yeah, that's a Gen X reference, dude. So, so back yeah. off. That's not a millennial thing, man. Come on. <laughs> well, Tetris, I've played Tetris before, and I've known where you're dreaming in Tetris, and you're seeing the, the different blocks fall. But how does that relate to being happy? Like, it takes kind of a leap to, like, it doesn't automatically come to you. So I was hoping he would have named it something like, look for the positive, or train your brain to always look for the opportunity, instead of calling it the Tetris effect, which you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Okay, yeah. I mean, I'm going to piggyback off of that. Yeah. I have to. Because this is actually something that I was going to say that I disagreed with, um, that not that I disliked, but it kind of turned me around. So for those of you who don't know what the Tetris effect is, because, I mean, I'm not a Gen D, so I didn't know what it was. <laughs> but um, basically they do all these studies where if you're constantly playing Tetris, like, over and over and over. Basically, if you do anything for a constant amount of hours in this study, it was Tetris, you start seeing it everywhere in your life. That's all you can focus on. So you'll be, you can be at the grocery store and be like, how can I stack these boxes to make it perfectly fit? Like, <laughs> it just like blows your mind. It's all that you can focus on. So one of the examples he said was like, he even experienced this when he would play hours and hours of Grand Theft Auto. And he was just playing and playing in the zone or whatever. And then he was like, okay, now I have to go out to like run an errand or something. And I guess he was walking outside and he was like, oh, what's the fastest way that I can get there to my location? Then he sees a cop car and he's like, let me just go and steal this cop car. He said he literally put his hand on the door um, and was like about to open it and try to steal it. And then it like clicked, like oh, I'm not in a video game, you know, like I'm in real life. Like, yeah. <laughs> so... The point is because, like, I've watched documentaries in the past, like, I don't know if y'all have seen Bowling for Columbine, the one about the shooting, um, the school shootings, and, you know, they always, they try to pinpoint it on video games, like, oh, it's these bad video games that are getting these people to do all this, like, this might be a hot take. I don't know if I, like, I think though, I thought there had been studies to prove that that's not possible, like, video games don't have any correlation towards shootings. But this kind of makes it seem like, yeah, it is. If they play it that much, they're in that mindset. They're just going to go, you know, steal a cop car and go crazy, shoot everybody, shoot everyone. So that's my point where I kind of, I disagree with that concept. But like he said, there's been studies on it. And I think the point, the point of him saying the Tetris effect, the useful part of it is the fact that like we can get in the habit of 
essentially scanning like negative things around you. So for example, like if your job is like a lawyer or like something where, or where you're trained to like read edits in papers, like you're trying, you're trained to spot out the mistakes, right? Okay. Well, if you're doing that constant hours and hours a day, then you're going to be doing that in your real life. You're going to be like, okay, kid, like my child, you're messing up on X, Y, Z. Cause you're only focusing on the negative. <laughs> So his point is, is that you can train your mind to focus on the positive instead. So yeah. that is a good thing that comes out of that. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about when I was listening to that part of the book, I was like, oh my God, I could never do that. Just be someone who sits around and just edits things all day long. That would be mind numbing. <laughs> Special person. Yeah. That'd That's why, I, Yeah. I thought too, like I could never be someone that like I've liked watching crime shows, but I can never actually deal with like death every day. Like that would just be too negative for me. I couldn't do it. But some people can, you know, separate that part, or can they? <laughs> okay. So something that I did like was the fact which i have heard this before and i feel like i do apply this generally but something i do want to mention to the audience is that um we can't change our reality but we can change the way our brains process the world um which in turn changes how we react to it so you know how they say like bad things are going to happen you know maybe you get in a car accident maybe you know somebody tries to steal you for credit card fraud i know those are kind of extreme examples but <laughs> Point being is that we cannot control that. Things sometimes happen to us. But what we can do is change how we respond to it. So just because of that doesn't mean we have to be all negative. We don't have to treat people poorly. You know, you say that in relationships all the time. Like just because you're upset, like don't, you know, that's no reason to get mad. Um, and it changes like how we perceive and act in the world. So the example that he used was that one time he was playing with his little sister when they were younger this was before like he was like eight or years old or something and that they were playing some kind of dragons or something and she fell off the top of the bed and he was supposed to be watching his sister while his parents were napping so he didn't want to wake him up and he knew she was about to belt out and cry but instead he's like wait you didn't hurt yourself like you know what that means you're a unicorn <laughs> So instead of her like crying, like, oh, I'm in pain, she was just like, what? Like, I am, I'm invincible. And she just like, you know, didn't cry. So <laughs> point is, is like, yeah, you fell. Yeah, that sucks. But instead of just crying about it, you can say, wow, I'm resilient. I'm so strong, whatever. So love that. I love that. <laughs> I would be a unicorn, fall out of bed. Poof, you're a unicorn. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> And to a five-year-old, yeah, that worked. So, okay, <laughs> moving on. What is something that you learned from the book that you didn't know before? And tell me one or more examples of how you're going to apply what you've learned um, to your real life. John, you can go first this time. Never play Grand Theft Auto because it might get you arrested. If you take anything from this podcast, that's what you should take. No, <laughs> no, I don't know if it was, if I learned anything in this book that was something I didn't know before because I think it came from different flavors and used some different examples from, from, from other books. But I think making things easier to do and forming the habits around it, kind of making those micro habits, he didn't use those words to play guitar. Instead of just getting onto yourself, trying to use willpower to do things using the 20-second rule. The 20-second rule is what I'm taking away from this today. But my son plays Grand Theft Auto, and now I'm really scared because he's going to college, and I think he still plays Grand Theft Auto, and I hope he doesn't get arrested. Buy him a different video game that's not as violent. All of them are first-person shooters now. I mean, no one plays Pac-Man or Tetris. <laughs> Tetris seems so, you know, passe, I guess, but I, I come from a world of 2D video games, you know, Pac-Man. <laughs> Pong. Droids, those yeah. types of deals we didn't have. Yeah. Although I did play some Duke Nukem back in the old days. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you can let him play the shooter games, but just don't let him have an actual gun. There you go, problem solved. Like, we live in Texas, come on. He's got to he's have a gun. That's what it goes without saying. There's two things every boy in Texas probably has. A pocket knife 
and a gun. <laughs> Even with the Daisy Red Rider. <laughs> so. Okay, well then when he doesn't notice, switch his gun with a water gun. <laughs> uh, nerf guns are almost just as bad. And the airsoft guns, oh my god. Have you ever been with an airsoft gun? <laughs> <laughs> no. It hurts. It's not pleasant. Okay. Okay, but it's not going to kill anybody. It's just going to hurt a little bit. <sighs> just don't play that much video games <laughs> before you get that mind. Yeah. There you go. Moral of the story, only play for like an hour a day or something. I, I think, you know, we always called that the blue car syndrome, you know. When you go out and you buy a blue car, and then all of a sudden you see all the other blue cars that are out there, and you're like, wow, mm-hmm. there was any blue cars out there until I got mine, and now they're everywhere. I don't know what it is. He does mention that. It's because that's what we're focusing on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, Joseph, what about you? There's two things in this book. I'm kind of like torn between. I love the idea of falling up. I love that idea of like looking for what's the best option when things are going wrong. Like what's what exactly can I do to make things better? So recently I had a flat tire and I had to buy a bunch of new rims. And I was like, how can I make some good out of this? Because I hate spending money on things like that. And it was, a lot, it was kind of a lot of money. and But I kind of thought about it, and I negotiated the price down, so I was kind of, like, using falling up there. And I also was able to, like, use it, like, as motivation to start building passive income. So, so, so I didn't have to worry so much about, like, depleting my emergency funds. Um, so I love that idea. But even more than that, what I like is a social investment. I think I tend to take my friendships for granted sometimes and just kind of, like, be like, no, I can't do that. I don't have time for that and kind of like put it on the back burner. So I'm going to start focusing. He gave me good, like selfish reasons <laughs> why to have good friends. Cause like apparently people who have good friends are less likely to get heart attacks. They have less stress. They deal better with life's problems. Um, and that made sense to me. So I think I'm going to start like not being in a rush when it comes to friends and like really taking time to focus on what's going on with them. And I think that'll make me happier and not for selfish reasons, but more likely to, uh, be more resilient. That sounds totally selfish. I'm going to have better friends to benefit me. <laughs> well, he gave me a reason. <laughs> no, I think what Joseph was saying is he already has friends, but maybe he doesn't treat them as well or doesn't see them as often as he should, and he's going to make yeah. a better effort to do that. I'm going to prioritize them more in a higher level. And this just gave me more reason to do so, but it's not just for selfish reasons, but partially for selfish reasons. I'll agree. I'll agree. <laughs> okay. Gotta be real. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. I love that. Okay, so for me, um, I was also going to say the 22nd rule, um, but that was kind of like my second one. The first thing I really wanted to say... Um, was so what to go. Mm-hmm. Well, the first one I was going to say is... Uh, um, it's not really a principle. I mean, it was in the principles, but it was about, um, the term deadline, um, is basically as negative as you can get. So, (laughs) um, in his, in the book, he gives the example how he is writing this book actually and that he had to have a deadline to finish the book so essentially it became a drag you know he was trying to procrastinate and avoid it because to him he considered it as like in a negative connotation yeah so like you know even though he loved to do it he loves writing he loves talking about this it's his life's work he loves reading and educating all that but writing it on paper ended up becoming work in his mind so he didn't want to do it which is why he says, like, deadlines as negative as you can get. So he says he ignored the constraint and focused only on the intrinsic value of the task at hand instead of simply when it was due. So when we reconnect ourselves with the pleasure of the means as opposed to only focusing on the ends, we adopt a mindset more conducive to not only enjoyment but better results. So I think... This probably also has to do like deeper with my procrastination problems is because I keep seeing it as like work and not fun and all that. But in reality, like I love doing this. I love reading. I love talking about it. Like it's not like I don't like doing what we're doing, but the social media aspect, I keep seeing work, all that work. (laughs) So I'm definitely going to use this and be like, stop considering it as like 
a deadline, just do it because you want to do it and just like retrain my mindset, which I feel like is similar to like what we've learned in mastery like a while back about how you're supposed to enjoy the process, not just like the end result. So working on it, working on it. <laughs> and then I like the 20 second rule too, because it's like, okay, make it easier, make the barriers to entry easier. So instead of having your guitar in the closet, have it right next to your nightstand. That way, that's 20 seconds easier than you had to go to the closet. So I'm going to try doing that. He gives the example of, like, when you have, like, if you're trying, like, the TV, you know, take the batteries out of the, TV, of the remote. So, like, okay, just that barrier, that's going to take me an extra 20 seconds to put the batteries in. And turn, that enough is, like, to stop you from that bad habit. Um, now the habit's not the TV anymore for me. It's the animals that I'm dealing with. <laughs> so. <laughs> just put them in the closet. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm in the great. No, I'm just kidding. We <laughs> so, take it further away. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, if you haven't watched our previous video, my boyfriend and I just got a, a puppy and a kitten, and we're in the process of trying to figure out how to train him, how to potty train him. Like, should it be in a crate? Should it just sleep on the couch? Like, all kinds of stuff. Um, if you know stuff, let me know. Give me some pointers, please. <laughs> Julie needs help. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so the point is, though, is that we kind of like switch off. So he might have him for a couple hours. I might have him for a couple hours. So I can able to get some stuff done. But well, I'm working around it. But I'm trying to make some easier barriers to keep them preoccupied so I can focus on my stuff. <laughs> can I piggyback off that? Yes, of course. As we read more and more books, it's becoming like you're seeing the same principles over and over, I'm noticing. Like this was a lot like atomic habits, make it easy or make it hard. I uh, agree. The 20 second rule is ba basically making it hard. So hide the Oreos so it takes you 20 sec seconds to go get to them. You're less likely to eat them. Mm -hmm. I Just agree. Yes, and yeah, please stick around, audience, till at our end of our year. Once we hit our one year mark, we will give a master best things we've learned from all the books we've read and so that might have something to do with it wait and find out <laughs> okay well any other last minute things we want to mention for the audience maybe yes maybe no i just want to mention that i really this is one of my favorite books out of the ones that we've read it's probably like my top five top ten of all the books that we've read because it's just so important. Like it, it got me focusing on being happy. It actually did work by getting me on focusing on being happy, which as he says towards the end of the book, that creates a ripple effect, creates more happiness outside of you. Other people kind of match your energy. So this is a book that could make your life more, more enjoyable, give you more well-being. I, I would recommend it. Yeah. You're happy I agree. and you know it. Clap yeah, your hands. Clap your hands. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Sean. Clever. Okay, so I do want to have one other thing I'd like to say to the audience. Just to piggyback. Oh, I like to clap. Just to piggyback off of Joseph. Yes, like he's, he mentioned, like, good things come from this book. I highly recommend it as well. Um, and so one more thing that I want to mention is for the professionals out there. Um, when you focus on positive, you profit on happiness, gratitude, and optimism. So expecting more positive outcomes will make them more likely to arise. So um, this is very important when you have an employee. It's a, I'm missing it on my notes here and somewhere, but it's basically the more you encourage your employees or you believe in them, the more successful they're going to be, especially if they know that you believe in them. So if you think, oh, this guy's not that smart, I'm going to have to micromanage him. Okay, well, then you're going to bring that into effect. You are going to have to micromanage them because you're manifesting that, basically. So, um, so basically, he says, the more you believe in your ability to succeed, the more likely you will. And he gives an example of they did a study with these Asian women and their testing ability. So... Basically, you know, the stereotype is that Asians are smart. So what they did is we, before they took the standardized test, they told them, you guys, are, you know, Asians, y'all are extremely smart people, blah, 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 blah. And then they did super well on the tests. Then they had them do another test and they said, y'all are women. And that's a stereotype that women aren't that smart. So 
women, you know, y'all aren't that bright, don't expect to do very well, I know you're not smart, or whatever, they, like, basically demoralized him, and then they saw the test results, and their tests were, like, really bad, <laughs> so the point is, is that, um, you know, you should hype yourself up, too, if you're worried, oh, he mentions that in the book as well, if you're worried about a presentation, you know, or something, don't just be down on yourself, and say, like, you know, you're horrible, you're going to ruin this, don't screw this up, yada, 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 you're just going to put too much pressure on yourself, and then you will bomb it. You need to separate yourself, even for a minute, watch a funny video real quick, and then, all of a sudden, you get yourself out of that negative mindset, and you'll kill the presentation. Yeah. And that shows, so how that, your, oh, that shows how your identity kind of creates your reality, and that's another thing we've heard in a lot of books is like, when their identity was, I'm really smart, then they became smart. When their identity was, oh, I'm not good at math, then they became not good at math. So you can also choose your, your identity to be something that will make you successful. Which is also what he says when you're feeling down at yourself, just focus on the positives. Don't think about your weaknesses. Focus on your positives. Um, okay. So with that being said, an action item for you, audience. <laughs> Twisting it up here. First time ever on Hustle and Nope <laughs> Entrepreneurial Experience. Um, in the book, he says to write down three good things that happened that day, and it'll basically force your brain to scan for the positives. This also has a little bit to do with the Tetris effect. I'm sure it's in that chapter. So basically, when you do this, you'll end up forgetting all the negatives in your life if you keep doing this daily. So challenge. Let me know if you follow through. <laughs> Yeah, right and three things down and play Tetris every day. And Grand Theft Auto, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm going to challenge you guys, too. Since Sean threw us last time with that challenge, I'm going to throw all of us this challenge, too. And audience, too. You okay. guys, too. We're all going to do it together. So three <laughs> things. We have to write down three things we liked about the day. That happened the day, yeah. The mm -hmm. journal approach. Three good things that happened every day. You do it at the end of the day. You'll mm -hmm. reflect and be like, what happened today? And just focus on the three good things. Okay. And, and you have to do it until we meet next. Okay. We haven't determined yet, so that's going to be... Which might, I think it'll be about a couple weeks. We'll, we'll discuss after the okay. day, the date. <laughs> okay well thank you everyone i feel like i talked a lot in this book but if that is any indication it shows that there's so many good principles in this book and we mm -hmm. highly highly recommend you check it out because we didn't we only got to cover a small portion but there's so much more that you can check it out and learn and apply so thank you hmm? even the book looks happy. Yep. yeah even the book has a smiley face <laughs> so thank you so much for watching the hustle and no entrepreneurial experience you can find more about the author and the book in the description and don't forget hustle beats talent when talent doesn't hustle bye see you next time <laughs>